Welcome back, squad. Thank you for checking out another episode of Full Ride, the college recruiting podcast. And as always, we are powered by you, Recruit You. I'm your coach and host, Quito Delgado. And uh, today I have a special guest joining me. His name is Brian Hamer. Uh, he's a former college student athlete. He played basketball. He got a full athletic scholarship. And after graduating uh, college, um, he went on to play overseas professionally for a few years. And now he is uh, one of the founders of a pretty cool uh, startup. And I'm going to let him uh, talk more about that. Um, but before we get to Brian, I uh, just want to do some housekeeping and also make a special announcement. So um, as always, you can learn more about You Recruit You. Uh, and our services and our missions and, you know, and really how we go um, about educating, empowering uh, and equipping our student athletes and their parents on how to navigate college recruiting. Um, so you can visit us at yourecruitu.com. That's yourecruitu.com and, uh, and get familiar with us if this is your first time uh, checking us out. Um, but for the rest of you, you should know by now, every, every single Thursday, uh, I come and I, I try to provide you with a winning play, a winning strategy that's going to help you stay on um, the right path uh, to college recruiting. And uh, again, I, as I mentioned before, today I have a special guest joining me uh, who's going to do an amazing, amazing job. But before we get to Brian, so I don't ask much, guys. At least I don't think so. Yes, I want you to subscribe to the podcast. You know, I always tell you to be a good teammate and share the episode with family and friends. But for the most part, um, I'm not patting myself on the back here either, but you know, the podcast, it's a free resource for you, right? It's a free resource. Uh, you, you expect it every Thursday. Uh, the downloads, you know, tell me, you know, our numbers, our monthly numbers, it tells me that you guys are definitely listening and based off of the emails that I get, it's been helpful, right? So I don't ask for much, but now I need you guys to do me a favor, right? Um, as many of you know, uh, maybe some of you do, maybe you don't. If this is your first time checking us out, you know, I am a former college athlete. Um, I was able uh, to, despite playing for a really small uh, high school, despite playing for a, a, high, a small team that had a losing record my junior and senior year, um, despite playing football in upstate New York, which is not a hotbed for college recruiting when it comes to football, despite all that, I was able and blessed to secure a full athletic scholarship to, to college where I played football. I eventually graduated from Northeastern University. I um, had ex incredible experiences, made great friendships, and just learned so many lessons along the way. And part of the reason why I am just so passionate about you recruit you, you know, and, you know, obviously bringing you uh, new episodes of Full Ride every single Thursday is because I just know that so many well-deserving, hardworking student athletes um, aren't as fortunate as me. Um, and they don't get scholarships to play in college. And their careers end um, their senior year of high school. And I want to do everything possible to provide uh, student athletes all over um, the United States with, you know, just I want to help even the playing field for some of you because I know – not everyone is going to be a five-star recruit. Not everyone plays for, you know, national championship or state title uh, type caliber, um, you know, high school teams. Not everyone plays on these, you know, big time AAU circuits, right? So many of you, you under the radar recruits, you have some challenges and I am fully aware of that. Uh, so I want to do everything I possibly can to kind of help even that playing field. Um, so in addition to doing You Recruit You, I'm now in the process though are really wanting to, to launch a foundation, right? I want to launch a foundation, a nonprofit that really um, allows me to award uh, well-deserving student athletes who are, you know, leaders um, in their community, um, who are good sports, you know, who demonstrate good sportsmanship, uh, who obviously are athletically talented, um, but then also most, as importantly, take care of business in the classroom. I want to be able to, you know, provide, you know, college-bound student athletes with scholarship money to help offset their out-of-pocket expenses, right? Um, I want to be able to help economically challenged um, 
families who may not be able to afford an SAT coach or an academic tutor for their son or daughter. I want to be able to provide them with financial assistance so that they can provide um, get those services. I want to be able to help local youth sports organizations, nonprofits. I want to be able to help them, you know, help, you know, um, you know, purchase equipment uh, for, you know, for their youth sports, whether it's basketballs, you know, basketball hoops, whatever the case may be. I don't really care what it is, but I want to be able to provide equipment to them. Um, right. Um, and of course, you know, doing all of this. Oh, and then lastly, um, you know, yes, I do offer my, you know, my one-on-one coaching program and, and I'm in the middle, I'm in the process of, of building an online academy for college recruiting um, that you can purchase. Um, but I also realize that not everyone's financially in a position to be able to pay for that, right? Um, it costs money and people got to make a decision between, you know, working with me one-on-one or, or paying for groceries. And I totally get paying for groceries, right? Um, but I want to be able to help even the playing field for those student athletes and their parents who may not be able to pay for my services, but if I can give it to them for free through my foundation, I want to be able to do that. Um, so that's all requires money. And guess what? I'm not asking you for money. I'm asking you for your vote. That's right, people. I know it's election season. We're not talking about that kind of election though, right? We're talking about the FedEx Small Business Grant Contest. It's an awesome contest that FedEx is putting together for small businesses and organizations for startups. Um, And the crux of it is the first place grand prize winner wins $50,000 grant. Second place, the silver award winner, they win a, I think it's a $30,000 grant. And then the third place winner, there's 10, you know, 10 third place winners. They each win, I believe, 10 or $15,000 grant. So it's an amazing um, contest props to FedEx for doing this. Um, that so many awesome organizations, well deserving organizations, you know, hardworking entrepreneurs like myself are a part of. Um, and this is no knock on them, but hey, I got to fight, you know, and I got to do what I can. I got to compete to make sure that I can hopefully win the first place award. But even if I don't get first place, maybe win second or third. And what I'm going to do is, you know, if I win this grant money, it's going to be able to allow me to launch my foundation. So if you believe in the mission, if you think this is a good idea, um, I would just be so humbled if you did one of the following things. All right. Just go to smallbusinessgrant.fedex.com. So smallbusinessgrant.fedex.com. When you get to that page, just scroll to towards the bottom and you're going to see a little button. You hit vote now. All you have to do is once you hit vote now, you can search by business name. And you just have to type in the letter U, then a space, the word recruit, then a space, and then the letter U. So U space recruit space U. That's one way to vote. I think you got to type in your name, your email address. Um, you select some pictures to make sure you're not a robot. You hit submit, you're done. Here's the best part. You can literally vote one time a day, one time every 24 hours between now and March 8th, right? So that's one way you can vote. Another way you can vote, you're all listening to your podcast, this podcast right now. I have the link, uh, to the small business grant. I have the link in today's show notes. You literally in the description, Find the link, you click on that, and it'll bring you right to the page, my personal page, where you can vote. And then lastly, if you follow us on Instagram, Twitter, you recruit you, all one word, you recruit you. If you follow us on Instagram and Twitter, the link is right in our bio. So you click that link in the bio, that's going to bring you to my personal page. You can hit vote. Really simple. And then lastly, you know, by now we have a Facebook page as well. Search you space recruit space you on Facebook. I have the link on the, on that page. So we are all over the place. The thing is, this competition started, I believe, like February 4th. I didn't register until February 25th. So I'm like three weeks behind. But I got to make up ground and I'm counting on my squad. I'm counting on you to, to help 
you know, make up some ground here. So please, please, please. And it's not about me. It's about being able to really, you know, launch this foundation so that I can really, you know, carry out my mission of, of helping out all you hardworking student athletes um, out there and, and lend some financial assistance to you, you, you parents who may, um, who may need that additional support in order to help your son or daughter. Um, so that's what we're all about. That's what we're doing. That's why I just need you to, to do whatever you possibly can. So not only can you not, can you not only do I want you to vote, but then I would love it. Absolutely love it. If you can share my link, you can either text it to your family and friends. You can go on, um, on social media. You can post a link, do what you got to do. If you have any questions, right? If you want to get involved, you want to try to help me promote it again, I'm not asking for your money, nothing like that. If you wanted this, if you have any questions on how to vote or whatever the case may be, just email me, coachkito at gmail.com, coach, K-I-T-O at gmail.com. That's all you got to do. Um, but that's what we got. The, the voting ends March 8th. So guess what? I'm going to be back next Thursday and I'm going to be doing the same thing. I'm going to promote it again one more time. Um, but that's what we got this week. That's my only ask of you. Um, and now my second ask is I just want you to sit back, relax, take good notes and listen to my man, Brian Hamer, uh, provide you guys with some incredible advice that's going to help you take control of your college recruiting process. Thanks a lot. And I hope you enjoy. Brian, how are we doing tonight, my man? I'm doing well by yourself. I can't complain. Can't complain. Just want to thank you, uh, first and foremost for, for hopping on the call. I know, uh, you know, being an entrepreneur uh, isn't easy. Uh, you wear a lot of hats. You got a lot of uh, people grabbing for your attention. So we're just really honored that uh, you um, join the squad to share uh, your recruiting story and, uh, you know, hopefully share some lessons uh, for our student athletes and also their parents. Uh, but we, uh, before we get to that, I did mention you are an entrepreneur. So talk to us about uh, what you're doing today before we get into the show. Yeah, so uh, myself and a couple other former Boston College athletes uh, started a company called Play Easy. It's a platform that connects uh, coaches, event organizers, tournament directors uh, to help them find athletic space online. Because right now it's uh, the tedious manual process of going on Google, Googling where basketball courts are, calling, emailing, asking people for availability. So really, we streamline that process to connect them with facilities and, and uh, book it directly online. That's awesome. Awesome. And I'm sure, uh, and I'll get to it in a second, uh, there's, uh, you know, some, lef some lessons that you apply as an entrepreneur that you learned as a former uh, college athlete and, uh, and even pro athlete. And we'll get to that in a second. But um, I love what you're doing because, you know, we do have, you know, parents, we have you know, event organizers, we have coaches who are listening uh, to this. So I definitely think your service uh, could definitely be of help to them. So uh, if they want to, to learn more about uh, Play Easy, where can uh, they find you on uh, the web and on uh, social media? Yeah, I think, uh, our, so our website right now is uh, getting relaunched. Uh, it's going to be go.playeasy.com. And then also you can go to our main one which is obviously playeasy.com and then social media wise uh best place to find us instagram uh at play easy sports p-l-a-y-e-a-s-y sports that's awesome so you guys definitely go check out uh play easy and then lastly i think it's pretty cool so one of your founders and his name escapes me but uh don't you have a one of the founders who is a kicker for the new york jets am i is yep. that correct so uh, <laughs> So it's uh, one of our co-founders, Ryan Quigley, was the punter in the NFL for seven years and the kicker for the Jets now interned with us last spring, right before he went to the Jets. But he was with like the Rams last year, bouncing around, but he had uh, his first full season with the Jets this year. Yeah, I got it. Sam mixed up. Yeah, Sam. So that's pretty cool, though. But and the reason why I brought it up, he's not a founder, but he was an intern. I thought it was pretty cool just because I obviously, you know, following you, following Play Easy, uh, he kicked the game winner on uh monday night football and then uh yep. the, the <laughs> announcer the announcer uh gave you guys a plug which was uh you know really cool joe tessator so that was really yep. awesome yep um, 
Uh, so, uh, so again, guys, real quick, we're talking uh, to Brian Hamer. Uh, I know Brian, this full disclosure. Uh, he's, a, he's a friend of mine, a um, little bit younger than me, but uh, he's from the 518 uh, that's connected in New York area, just like me. And we actually went to uh, the same high school, Nordame Bishop Gibbons, about a decade apart. And uh, I, oh. earned, I earned a scholarship for football. And uh, Brian earned a scholarship uh, for basketball. So uh, we're definitely proud of, uh, of our school. And uh, so we have that in common. But I wanted to uh, and even though we went to the same school and from the same town, I'm sure our recruiting stories uh, are, are a little bit different. Um, I even play different sports, um, but there's always di different circumstances. I always share with families that uh, no recruiting process uh, is the same, right? So why don't you take a few moments quickly just to kind of, when did you know you wanted to actually play uh, basketball in college? College, oh, first grade. I mm. grew up with a basketball, youngest of four boys. Dad is a coach, grew up in the gym. And uh, my dad ran the, the rec league at St. Madeline Sophie right down the street. So from a young age, I was definitely was on the court. So I knew from a young age that I wanted to play. Oh, Never so, you knew, doubt. so you knew very young. Now, did you play multiple sports growing up or were you pretty much locked in on basketball early on? Soccer and basketball my whole life. All right, so, so you, from first grade on, soccer and basketball. All right, so multi-sport athlete. I like that. So now, at what point, um, you know, did you, you know, did you know playing? You know, it's one thing for you to to want to play in college, um, but it's an all as many of our student athletes uh, either have found out or are finding out now, it's a whole other story to actually become a recruited athlete, uh, get on the radar of a college coach, and earn uh, a full ride like you did. So. At what grade, you know, did college recruiting kind of, you know, when did that process really begin for you? So I'd say the college recruiting process itself um, started taking place when I was in ninth grade. Because uh, when I was in ninth grade at Gibbons, I started leading the team in scoring then. So I definitely like hit some radars then. But when I personally started taking it serious was probably around like sixth grade. And that's just because I... Again, I, I had the luxury of having three older brothers, so I watched them go through college. I uh, watched them play my whole life, so I kind of was able to learn from some mistakes, but also learn from how they got recruited as well. So I think there was this one instant that really stands out to me, which was my brother was playing modified basketball, and it was just one kid on the, the team who was really good. He had like probably 20-something at the time. I'm sitting next to my dad. Watching them play, and I'm like, wow, that kid is so good, like, blah, blah. My dad looked at me, he's like, he's like, you know what's funny? He's like, fast forward a few years from now, he's like, the best players on the court won't be the best players anymore. And I looked at him, and I'm like, like why? Because I was sitting there, a little kid, I was in awe, and he's like, he's like, a lot of these kids don't care. He's like, a lot of kids have the natural talent, but this is the grade, and it was seventh, eighth grade, he's like, this is the grade where it starts – become a factor of how hard you work and like how bad you want it. Like seventh, eighth grade is where you're like, all right, do you want this to, or not? So I, re I remember that from sixth grade when he told me that. And I was like, wow, I was like, all right, I need to dial in here and uh, start really taking it seriously. So then I had the goals of uh, playing at a high level. And then in eighth grade, I played varsity basketball. And then I only averaged four points, five points, barely played. I was the last person off the bench. Then ninth grade next year, started leading the team in scoring. Mm. And you're a man after my heart because anyone, uh, not that I give, you know, a hundred speeches a year or anything, but, you know, I definitely give, a, you know, a good amount. <laughs> I know I do give a good amount, uh, whether it's, you know, uh, to, to teams directly or at a conference or at a workshop, whatever the case may be. And one of my go-tos <laughs> is I always say, uh, talent alone has an expiration date, right? And a lot of kids, exactly. um, you know, they, they, they get by on their, you know, their God-given ability, whether it's their height, you know, maybe they have their strength, their speed, uh, whatever the case may be. But at some point in time, uh, the rubber hits the road where your, your work ethic and your commitment uh, to getting better uh, each and every day. And it's not just doing what, other kids are doing like so everybody your coach calls a two-hour practice if everyone discusses a two-hour practice 
what are you doing before? What are you doing after? What are you doing on those off days when it's not supervised? And it sounds like at a really young age, particularly sixth, seventh grade, you locked in um, to, to really, uh, you know, to, to take your game to that next level. And I just love, you know, what your dad said. Uh, it sounds like it really, uh, you know, it set home, um, it hit home with you. So you're, you're, you're doing your thing at Bishop Gibbons. And this, you guys know, if you guys who listened to the podcast before, Bishop Gibbons is not a, uh, you know, this big time school, you know, I don't know about you, but my graduating, no. <laughs> class, my, my graduating class, we had 64 kids. Uh, you know, we we're, yeah, we're playing, 55. Yeah. We're playing, you know, you know, smaller schools. So now did you get recruited through the high school? Or did you play AAU? Just kind of walk us through that process, you know, for, for a family who may be in a similar boat as you, where you play for a small school against you know, no knock on, you know, your ability, but, you know, maybe not the, the best competition. So how did you, how were you able to navigate recruiting despite playing at a small school? Yeah, I got, so I got lucky because, uh, as you know, obviously your nephew drew, I grew up with drew. Um, a lot of my friends are good athletes. So at Gibbons, my, I feel like my AU team ended up going to Gibbons. So we had a run of like four years where we were actually in the best conference in the Big Ten in AA. And we had a, a – Bishop McGinn won two state championships that year. CBA was one of the best teams in the state. So we were always playing the best competition. So, obviously, college coaches are going to those games. Like, Taylor Battle went to Penn State. He's a, I think he's one of two players ever to have 2,000 points and 500 assists and 500 rebounds in Big Ten history. So we had some good college coaches in the gym. And, obviously, in a – D2, but you got high D1 coaches in the gym, and then you got those kids winning state championships. It also helps you too because there's, there's going to be spread out because now those coaches are you're going to get mid level there, you're going to get low D1, you're going to get high D2. So I actually got lucky playing in that conference and, and having a good team that year. We got third for three straight years behind Bishop Ginn and CBA. And then my junior year, we won the whole thing in Class A, we won sectionals. So we had some notoriety there. Um, so I'd definitely say winning is a big part of it because the more you win, the more notoriety you get, the more your stats matter. If you're averaging 30 and you're not winning, coaches don't care as much. I mean, it depends. You got to really have good tape, but winning is obviously the most important thing there because it, it, you go, you end up going to the end and staying in the paper and doing all the interviews and yeah. people are coming to see you. Absolutely. And I just want to, so again, we're talking because we're obviously familiar. So, there may be some listeners who are like class A, class B. What are you guys talking about? So, here right, Capitol, right. so, so for us, um, and what, what Brian is saying is, you know, we have I think four, four or five levels. Class AA, that's your large school. Class A is your, um, you know, medium to large school. Then you got class B, class uh, C, and class D. And obviously, the lower, you know, the D is like super small schools. So ideally really we were a you know on paper a class you know c class b type school yeah. but for some reason which is still blows my mind because i remember it happened to us and we played but for some reason yeah. when it came to basketball they had us playing class a schools so um that's yeah. what brian is saying so what so in a way he did get lucky um, because he wasn't playing those class B, class C schools. He was actually playing up in competition against some really top talent. Um, but one thing you said, and I don't want this to go overlooked, um, because you said you got really lucky. And maybe you did get lucky because you were sharing the court with, you know, some high caliber players. Uh, and that obviously attracted college coaches to those games. But I always say luck uh, – you know, obviously happens um, when, when it meets, you know, when preparation meets opportunity, right? So you can be playing in packed gyms, but if you're not playing, if you're not prepared for that moment, if you're not prepared to go to against one of the best players in the state or to compete against one of the best teams in the state, if you're just ca catching L's and you're turning the ball over or you're missing a bunch of shots, you, you have bad body language, you know, you're not hustling that exposure can actually backfire. So I just want to give you props and really any student athlete. Oh, I want, no, you, no. I want you guys to understand that, that, you know, the exposure in the platform is only good if you take full advantage of it. 
And lastly, I'll just say, I don't want to get back to Brian. I don't want to hog the interview here, but it's really important for you guys to, to realize that you never know who's in the gym. You never know who's watching you. So a coach may be there scouting one or two other players. You may not even be on their radar, but you go out and you completely ball out regardless of sport. You, you get their attention. And then now that's how you can potentially get discovered. So um, I really love uh, that you shared that. So now, now, did you play AAU though? Yeah, I did. I played, uh, I, I played for a couple of teams at AAU. Okay. And now did, were, did, did that process help you at all playing AAU or do you think it was really more, I mean, again, this is it's a little bit different now. I feel like AAU is so huge. I mean, the majority of, of, of players are getting discovered on the AAU circuit, you know, in the, in the different tournaments and so forth. But would you say you got um, discovered more on the high school circuit or in AAU? Uh, definitely AAU. AAU just because it's easier for coaches to evaluate because all the top talent is in one place. So just kind of what you're saying to compare with the high school is like you could have a class C player averaging 35 and you're like, I don't really know how to judge this talent. Now you get that kid going to the AU circuit, playing against top talent. Now you're seeing how he's doing against that talent, which is much easier to evaluate, which was actually the biggest knock on Jimmer before he went to BYU because people are like, oh, can he score against like these small, quick guards, these high D1 guards? Then he plays for the City Rocks, and then he'd go and light them up for 52. And these people are like, oh, wow, all right, this, this dude can play. So the AU circuit definitely opens that up and gives you the opportunity to play against some of the top-tier talent. Yeah, and just so you guys know, we, he, again, he, Brian is talking to me because, you know, we're both from the 518, so we know the names really, really well. So, Jim, <laughs> so Jimmer is Jimmer for debt. Uh, and Jimmer, and for those who watch college ba- basketball, you should probably know him. Um, but uh, National player of the year. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah he went to Glens Falls, uh, which is a smaller school here in the Capital Region, um, like just destroyed – you know, high school, but he was, like you said, he was playing class C. So people kind of were sleeping on him or were trying to hate on him a little bit. Um, so then, no, he played AAU. He ended up going to BYU on a full ride, national player of the year, had a nice NCAA run. And then he ended up getting drafted, I believe, by, was it the Knicks? Did he that draft? Uh, Kings. The Kings, yeah. Kings. The Sacramento Kings. Kings. Yep. Yep. Sacramento Kings. Um, he had a nice, a, sh- a short NBA career, but now he's crushing it over in China. But my point is, he got, he got to the NBA playing Class C basketball in upstate New York. <laughs> so my, um, just let that be hope for all of you listening that, you know, there's this myth that, oh, I play for this small school. I'm not going to get discovered. Woe is me. Like, I'm not saying it's going to be and when, easy, but it's definitely possible. Oh, you know without doubt. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, and when he was there, they actually were Class A when he was at Glens oh, Falls, too. Okay. Yeah. And so th- well, he was Class A. They were there and there, but then he just destroyed on the circuit. Him yeah. and Battle and yep. Mark Lyons were three point guards in City Rocks, and they all ended up being top ten point guards in D1. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so back to now, let's talk about some strategies, some lessons uh, learned. So obviously, where did you end up? No, I know, but just for our audience, where did you end up uh, eventually uh, signing a national le- letter of intent to attend? Uh, Stonehill College. It's uh, south of Boston, about 20, 30 minutes south of Boston, and uh, the D2 conference in the Northeast 10. Northeast 10. Um, and now, so talk about how did you know, because I think a lot of families struggle with this. I know I did. I remember, I can tell a quick story. I remember I got um, my first, you know, questionnaire, right? Now, I thought it was a recruiting letter, but it was now looking back on it, it was a questionnaire. I got my first questionnaire, uh, one from Syracuse, and then like two weeks, a week later, another one from Boston College. And I was, I remember bringing the the envelopes to school. <laughs> I'm sharing it with my <laughs> friends. Like, yo, look, these guys. And so I filled it all out with my parents. You know, back then, it was, nothing was online. Like, you filled it all out by hand. I mailed it in to the coaches. Um, I, I sent them my recruiting tape, um, you know, my highlight little package, you know, on VHS. <laughs> my mom and my dad helped me put together. <laughs> And never heard back from him <laughs> after that. But I thought yep. for, for, I swore up and down for like a month, two months that like I'm getting recruited by my Boston College and by Syracuse. 
Um, never heard from any of those coaches. So that was a lesson that I learned. But so when did you really know, you know, that coaches um, were were really interested in you and they were starting to really engage? Like, was there, a, you know, did you, how did you know you were being a recruited athlete? When they write handwritten letters, because, you know, someone's now investing their time, because kind of what you said with the questionnaire, the questionnaire is a volume game. It takes two seconds to pack a letter, and it's probably not even a coach. He's probably just packing up to, like, teams that were either won or someone else heard of these players, and they're just sending them out. Because a lot of times, too, it's like, all right, I'll be at this tournament. So they'll go, like, randomly look at a bunch of kids, and they'll filter down from there. But the, the coaches that invested their time to, to write letters, to, to call – to get, you could be called they had a good tournament and ask when, where we're playing next. Cause I played for a few teams. So I was at different uh, places every weekend. So it's the ones that invest their time are the ones that you know are taking you serious because they're not just going to waste their time with a million recruits. No, I think you just hit the nail on the head. And I like that the way you said invested their time. Um, Cause the, I mean, not just with college coach, I think with, with every, every person <laughs> uh we all right. uh, want the one resource that we we tend to not get enough of is time so whenever a college coach actually sits down to to write a handwritten note even if it's just two sentences if they wrote your write you a handwritten note uh they send you a quick text or call and they're asking you where your you know your next game is you know they ask for your schedule they say oh what tournament are you playing in this weekend those little things, mom and dad, student athletes listening, it's that's when you know that you're really being recruited by uh, a, col uh, a college coach. And you got to pay attention to that. Don't, don't fall in love. I mean, it is so easy now with all the different, you know, email campaigns that they have out there. You may you get, a, you get a, an email from a coach. These coaches, it takes them two seconds. They have an assistant. They take your email. They, they blind copy. And they just send out a blast email and they can, you know, insert your first name with some formula. And literally you get an email, to buy, um, they can email 500 kids at the click of a button. Right. Same thing. If yep. it's a letter, if it's one of those questionnaires, they have, you know, the director of operations or an assistant, you know, an intern, speaking of interns from earlier, an intern, they say, Hey, listen, we got all these letters, fold up these letters, write the, you know, print off these address labels and then send them to the mail room and they just put it through, you know, the Pitney Bowes, you know, mail, you know, stamp system. And it literally takes them five minutes to do that. They're not even doing it themselves. So I really need you families, you know, the way you, the way a coach shows you that they're interested in you is by investing their time. Uh, so I think that's, that's really key. So I don't know about you. One but, thing, yeah, go ahead, please, please go. Oh, I was going to say one thing I'll add to that, too, that I saw a lot, big mistake, either, whether it was a kid who didn't have good guidance or people that weren't informed of recruiting is you, a lot of kids don't put their egos to the side and they might think they're D2 or D1 and they ignored all those high D3 calls. I'm talking like good D3 schools, good education, schools that were going to the final fours that could compete with like below D2s easily. Like we have some great D3 players here in Boston. And they ignored those calls. Next thing you know, they're stuck. Because now they didn't get those scholarship offers they thought they're going to get. And now they're not going anywhere. Now they're trying to go to JUCO. Now they didn't have a good season, could have gotten injured. And it all started because they didn't call that D3 coach back. No, I love and I've seen that happen multiple times. No, I, I love that. And, and I think it just goes back to, um, I think, families you guys we all have to but particularly families I and mean, again me and you we've gone through the process so I'm not saying we're experts but you know we did at the end of the day you're, you're, you're listening to um you know humble brag here you're listening to people who graduated college debt free so take it for what it's worth guys <laughs> but you know what i'm saying that's the end of the game right, right. uh that's and that's what that's what we all and that's why brian's on the you know dropping in, information that's why i do this every single thursday because i want the same for you um so but Recruiting, it has to be an egoless um, adventure. And when I say egoless, is egoless meaning you, know, you got to put your ego to the side because so, to Brian's point, so many recruits, you're a sophomore, you're a junior, you have no idea ultimately what you're going to end up being if you're going to be a D1 talent, D2, D, whatever the case may be. You don't know 
ultimately what, what you're going to be. You can hope and you can work towards it. But ultimately, the only opinion that really matters is a college coach. And if college coaches don't, don't deem you as a Division I talent, and along the way, you just kind of, you know, look down at all the D2 opportunities, the D3 opportunities, the NAI, the NAIA opportunities. Come your senior year and you blew all those coaches off. You returned none of their emails. You returned none of their calls. You didn't fill out any of the questionnaires that they sent you, right? They asked you for your schedule and you ignored it. Well, now when your back's against the wall come senior year, guess what? Just because you ignored them doesn't mean they stopped recruiting. <laughs> they kept filling right. up their funnel. So now all of a sudden, here it is, you know, February, March, like, hey, coach, you got, you know, you got that, you know, let's, I want to talk to you now. And they're like, oh, sorry, guy. Uh, <laughs> we already got our, we, our, our roster's already filled out. And now you're left scrambling. Right. And to Brian's point, you're stuck. And so I think that's a really invaluable lesson uh, that you, uh, that you shared. Hey. So go, go ahead, please. I was going to say, and, and without a doubt, one thing that always happens is talent stands out in college. If you do think you're that good for D3, then go D3 and prove it. I mean, you've seen kids do it. Duncan Robinson, who's on the heat right now, went, is from Massachusetts, went to Williams College for a year, so under-recruited, transferred to Michigan, was one of the best shooters in the country at Michigan, 6'7 shooter, and now he's in the Miami Heat. So that's one kid who went D3. Didn't go, didn't decide to go to prep or anything like that. Went D3, got so under-recruited, crushed it, went to high D1, then the NBA. Rare, but he also bet on himself. No, I love that. And, oh, I love that piece of advice you just gave. Oh, man, we even, because we, we have another individual here uh, from the Capital Region. We can go on it. I mean, the, the examples are endless, man, to be honest. But, like, Joe Cremo. Oh, yeah. right. Joe Cremo, another talent right. here from the Capital Region, really under-recruited. But even as an under-recruited athlete, he still went Division I, played at uh, SUNY Albany for three years, was one of the best players in the conference, uh, really stood out. And then he graduated in three years, and he had a year of eligibility. And his last year, he transferred and he played at Villanova. So I think part of this is don't have an ego, but then also just, you know, ultimately bet on yourself. Like if you really think, if you're that confident, you know, you have that much of, you know, faith in your ability. Don't leave free money on the table. Go D2, go D3, right. go NAIA for a year, two years. Then you transfer and you still got two years of eligibility if you want to play at the Division One level, right? Ultimately, right. the goal should be to go to college at a deep, deep discount. Don't pay, don't pay a uh, retail price for a college education. <laughs> I, I preach that. Like, don't pay full price. Uh, so I, I absolutely love uh, that advice, uh, you know, uh, that you just gave. Again, I'm talking to Brian Hamer. He mentioned it earlier. He, so he, um, obviously, he went uh, D2 full ride. But he's also our, our alma mater. Again, Nora Dane Bishop Gibbons. He's our all-time leading scorer. And then after college, uh, you even had the opportunity from Division II again. Uh, talk about what happened after you played uh, once you graduated from college. Yeah, so yeah, so this is actually some, a good lesson for kids here. Uh, I had my best year my junior year of college. We went to the Final Four. We won. So I had three conference championships in college. Went to the Final Four my junior year. That's when my stock was the highest. I just got MVP of the Final Four. We lost to the national champion by like five points that year. And we went into the se my senior year, preseason ranked like 12 in the country. My class had returning uh, all our, our class. And then we only graduated like two seniors. We had five incoming freshmen living on this high from the final four. And we had the worst season in my four years. We didn't have the chemistry. I threw out my shoulder the first week, uh, tried to play through it the whole season. My stock was down. So after the season, I was rehabbing. But obviously, coming off of Final Four, your stock drops. Now, me, this is, goes back to betting on yourself. I was like, all right, I had people contact me about playing overseas the year before. People saying, oh, you're on a trajectory, blah, blah, blah. My stock was down. So I needed to take anything that I could get. And I, myself, put my own tapes together. I was emailing a bunch of places. I emailed this one um, this one agency, 
dynamics, global management. I'll never forget this. Guy gets back to me, Brian, reviewed everything. Like, we're not going to move forward with you, blah, blah. I took that. I printed it out. I tacked it to my wall. I rehabbed all summer. Uh, I ended up going to Ireland, which is lower basketball level than I wanted. But also, they're giving me the option to get a free MBA. So, I was going to take that. Mm. So, I was playing pro basketball in Ireland. Got my MBA over there. And then that year, I ended up getting player of the year in Ireland. I was averaging like 44 in Ireland. Got player of the year in the country. The same exact place that denied me ended up signing me. I played in Spain the following year for the same guy that denied me because now I was in Europe. He could see me playing Europe. I had a 60-point game over there. And then they saw the tape of that game. They signed me. I ended up going to Spain. Uh, one of the players I was playing against in Spain, I was 24. We used to play pickup right in Madrid and Luka Doncic. They were like, oh, this kid's like one of the best players in Europe, blah, blah. 16-year-old kid. We're playing pickup with Luka. I mean, it, it was a great experience. But I think the biggest thing coming off that senior year was it's easy to, to keep your head down and when your stock drops. Or, like I mentioned before, you can bet on yourself, put your chips in there, and just keep grinding it out and see what happens. That's a great story, man. I love that story. Whoo. Uh, oh, man. Yeah. There's so many, and there's this, uh, like, so one thing, the reason why I'm just so passionate about, you know, just trying to help kids play sports for as long as possible, even like beyond high school. Like, and again, you can, you play from, you know, six years old to 17, 18 years old. That's great. And you're going to learn a lot of life lessons, um, along the way, you're going to develop friendships. You're going to have great experiences. Don't get me wrong. Like, so if, if for some reason your, your high school playing days end in high school, there's no shame in that. But think about the, the life experiences you were able to experience and the lessons you learned along the way simply because you did not, you know, you weren't that student athlete that looked down at D2. Like, you know, I can go – because how many kids could have said, oh, I'm, I'm – you know, like you, you know, from Bishop Gibbons, you were, you know, player of the year in the area. I mean, you were beasting. I remember, like, I remember reading about you and stuff. Uh, like, you were crushing it. And, like, you probably sometimes thought, like, I'm a Division One talent. But because you said, you know what, I'm going to keep my options open. You go D2. You have these amazing experiences, ex- experience a ton of, of winning your first three years. But then you, you learn through adversity your, your senior year. You keep pushing, you, you bet on yourself, and then you get to go and travel the world to Ireland, Spain, you know, like that's, that's, what, that's what, what we're after right here. Yes, he wants you to go to college and, and maybe get a scholarship, but it's also the experiences that, you know, there's, no, there's nothing better than being a college athlete uh, and like just how it prepares you uh, for life. So like, I just absolutely love, that's one of the best stories and no, no offense to our previous guests, but that's one of the best stories um, and I hope it really resonates uh, with our student <laughs> athletes that are listening. You're going you're gonna to love it even more, too, because I know I, I've heard you preach this all the time, too, about SAT scores. So mm. Patriot League, I was getting recruited heavily in Patriot League. I was like low D1, high D2 guy, which is usually like Patriot League to the NE10. The NE10 is like top of D2, Patriot League is like lower D1. I didn't qualify for scholarships from SAT scores. I was not mm. – so I had a 92 average in school. But to go Ivy or Patriot League, Ivy don't get full scholarships, just so they can make it up academic. They can do some push and pull there. But Patriot League didn't give you they can give you a full ride. I didn't qualify SAT wise for a full scholarship there. And I took SAT classes, tried to get it up there, and ended up being a, a later commit to Stonehill because at the time I was kind of set on going D1. So it ended up being a blessing in disguise because I think sometimes kids get set on going D1 instead of really just finding the right fit. And knowing yourself and do you fill a void with a certain roster instead of just picking the division. Yeah. So that's just a good lesson. I mean, again, things always tend to work out, but even when things work out, like, again, I, things worked out for me with college recruiting and how I was able to go division one, all that, all that stuff, but I still made a ton of mistakes along the way. So sometimes we, you know, we look at our successes and say, and we ignore the mistakes we, we made along the way. So I still want, our, our student athletes listening, Brian said it like he had other opportunities to potentially play division one, but the reason why he did it was because of um, his inability to qualify for, for the SAT. So, 
you know, mom, dad, you know, I, I beat this drum all the time. I'm a broken record, but rarely oh, yeah. my tips is, for you is to take the SAT early and often. You know, I say sophomore year to end of your sophomore year and people look, look at me like I'm nuts, but like the test, this is an important test. And when you, when you think about it, there's potentially hundreds, like, and this is no exaggeration here, hundreds of thousands of dollars on the line in potential scholarship money. Right. So yeah. why wouldn't you take it as a sophomore one time? Why wouldn't you take it again at the start of your junior year and then at the middle of your, of your junior year if necessary? And then, oh, by the way, if you're willing to pay for a trainer, you know, you're willing to pay for all these tournaments, you're traveling all over the place, you're staying in hotels. Why wouldn't you set aside just a few dollars here to, to get your son or your daughter that SAT coach and don't wait until your senior year to take it because not only does it hurt you in recruiting, you know, from a standpoint of when a coach calls you as a, you know, your end of your junior year to start your senior year, they want all your ducks in a row. They want to say, okay, let me see your transcript. Let me see your SAT scores. And then once they know you're a qualifier, then they can get down to brass tacks and start negotiating with you. But if it's like, oh yeah, coach, you know, I'm working on raising up this grade and I'm taking the SAT in, in five months, they're like, uh, okay. And then moving on. Right. So right. take it early um, in that process. So I love that you, you shared that. Cause you know, uh, I, that's good advice too. I definitely preach that constantly. So uh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, so if you were now, again, it worked out for you things, um, you know, definitely. And you've already shared a lot of advice, uh, particularly through the storytelling, which I really appreciate. But it put yourself now in the shoes of a, you know, maybe a freshman, uh, you know, regardless of sport. They're entering, because I think there's a big shift that you have to have in mindset once you go from middle school. Not that your early education doesn't matter, but really once you get to that ninth grade and beyond, that's when from a recruiting standpoint, the rubber really hits the road. Everything matters your grades and your performance everything so what advice would you give to you know that that student athlete that maybe is entering their freshman year their sophomore year and they really do have a goal what do you want them to to really um lock in on now yeah i think it's important from a goal setting standpoint because i i do it to this day is write your goal down somewhere, tack it to your wall, whatever you got to do, but then also reverse engineer that goal. So whether that goal is D1, D2, D3, college, or do something academically, like write that goal down and then figure out the steps that you have to take to reach that goal. Because if you're looking four years in the future, three years in the future, that's too long. Sometimes it, it takes way more steps than that. And then also it helps to see who else has achieved that goal. And how do I stack up against them? Like, for example, when I was watching game film playing basketball, I'm not watching these high-flying athletes because, let's be serious, I'm not sitting there windmilling. I'm watching these point guards that are methodical or coming off screens, can shoot, are being, playing smart because those are the type of players that you got to master because you, you play like them. So from a goal-setting standpoint, see people who have achieved your goal or similar to your goal and then – Verse engineer how you make it there and also see how they did as well. Ooh, I love it. I love it. I love it. So write down your goal, which is important. Um, but then once you write down your goal, because again, you, it is hard, you know, if you're 15, 16 years, years old to project out three, four years. Uh, so to help you maintain that focus, you want to write it down, but then reverse engineer it. So, uh, you know, and you, you break it down. What do you have to do each and every day to improve on your game? Um, but then also take that same mindset in the classroom. You know, what do you have to do in the classroom before school, after school um, to, to make sure you're, you get, you're maximizing your, your grades, your SATs, all that stuff. So it's not just, you know, reverse engineering it for, um, you know, athletically, but also do it academically, uh, do it from a nutrition standpoint, uh, as far as, you know, how you eat, all that stuff. But then the last part that Brian made that I love, the point, excuse me, that Brian made, was like we live in this amazing world where every you your favorite player if you really want to you can watch them play every single night or every single game yep. you can watch them play every single game i'm not trying to date myself and say oh back in my day but back in my day you know again from a <laughs> football standpoint you know i grew up again in upstate new york the only teams i got to watch play 
<laughs> during the, you know, on the Sundays were the Giants, the Bills, or the Jets, right? So if I wanted to right. watch, unless it was like a Monday night football game, um, I, don't, I was only stuck watching those three teams play and their opponent. Well, now, though, if, if you're, say you're a quarterback, right, just as, as an example, if you're a, bas- a football player, you're a quarterback, your favorite quarterback is, throw out Russell Wilson. You can literally watch Russell Wilson play every single Sunday if you want with, you know, by, you know, with these different NFL packages, right? Uh, the red And there's someone on YouTube that's probably broken down his film from two hours into 30 minutes for you. Exactly. And I was going to get to that too. So not only can you watch them play in a lot real time, but now we also live in this age where you can follow that individual on, on social media. Almost every pro athlete is posting drills that they do. So you can learn from that. You can follow trainers who post a million free drills and stuff to do. But then to Brian's point, you got YouTube. So there's really no excuse for you to find that online, if you will, mentor, like that virtual mentor and just mirror your game. Like we just, you know, um, you know we just lost Kobe Bryant. And everybody, and I don't know if, you, if, if, if anyone watched this, but, you know, I was really touched by, you know, Michael Jordan's, you know, tribute to Kobe Bryant and without going into all of it. But one thing that really struck with me was that Kobe Bryant, anyone that knows, he always, I mean, he mirrored his game after, after MJ. His walk, the way he talked, his everything, footwork, fadeaway jump shot. But then he also would just literally, now you can't text your favorite athlete, but my point is he knew who he wanted to be and he was studying Michael Jordan, you know, from a very young age all the way up until he made it to the, to the NBA. So to Brian's point, reverse engineer that. Take that favorite athlete of yours, those handful that you admire, and yes, it's cool to cheer for them and root for them, but also learn from them and, and try to, you know, pattern your game after them. Now, if you're a point guard and let's just say, um, you know, Giannis is your favorite player. Yes, Giannis can be your favorite player, but don't really try to pattern your game after Giannis because you're a <laughs> point guard, right? But find players that, are, that suit your game and study them. That's part of being a great athlete, right? That's part of having that, that mentality, that mindset, is you have to be willing to actually study the greats. And many of you are too busy cheering for them, and you're not, actually, you're not learning from them. So I absolutely love uh, that you, you shared that advice. I'm going to let you go in a little bit, but before we do, this another life, another life lesson I want you to share. I mentioned it earlier. You know, you talked about Play Easy, um, you know, great uh, business that you are you're building. You know, we, we talked a little bit before, but you said you, you, it's a slow build. It's a grind. And uh, I just love that you, you're going through this. But what lessons did you learn as, as you know, as a college athlete and, and pro athlete? because uh, again you were a pro athlete as well what did you learn as an athlete that now has helped you um as an entrepreneur yeah good question um it's it's definitely communication i mean everyone's wearing multiple hats everyone sometimes you're working in different places people are in different meetings so communication with your team members updating people being on the same page and knowing that same thing as a successful team that everyone everyone has the same goal and make sure you're repeating that goal. Everyone's working towards that same goal weekly. You guys are having check-ins, you're talking, you guys are meeting, but then also that you're actually putting the work because the best thing you can do is prove that you're doing the work, which is getting stuff done and that you're moving the needle. And even touching on what you said about um, following the people that you admire and learning from them, that goes the same in business too. Because one of the things is, like now you're a tech entrepreneur and what we're trying to build is a platform. It's a marketplace, just like, like Uber, Uber has the, the person looking for a ride and Uber has a driver. So you have demand and you have supply. We got people looking for courts and then we have facility space. There's demand and supply. So now what I would do and am doing is now study these marketplaces, study the economics, study the, the supply side, the demand side, how they made it work and now learn how these companies built it and then get the right model to not execute it. So those same things in sports relate directly to the business world and entrepreneurship as well. 
there you have it. See that is lifelong lessons that you can, that you can apply as an athlete. Like, you know, I think a lot of people think that just because they no longer play doesn't mean they can't still apply the mindset um, that they had as an athlete. Uh, you got to work hard. You have to sacrifice. You have to, you have to communicate with your teammates. Uh, you have to, you have to have a game plan. You have to execute it um, all in the name of, of hopefully uh, getting that win. Uh, so, so Brian, that's some great advice. And before I let you go, um, I want you to, to, to help our, our student athletes out. I always, you know, whether it's myself or a, uh, the guest, uh, give our student athletes a, a winning play. You know, I don't know if it's a pep talk, but like, what's, what's a strategy? Like we just talked about strategy from a business standpoint, but what's a strategy that a student athlete, uh, and their parents or just a student athlete, what's something that they can do this week that that can really help them you know get one step closer to to earning you know an athletic scholarship to college yeah uh learn from everyone around you and that goes for say you're the not the best player that goes for obviously learning from the best player also learning from the worst player uh, the most coachable player because one thing i've learned is when you play obviously you play football there's more players in the team is that Everyone has their strengths and everyone has their weaknesses. Be aware of the people's strengths and then learn from those strengths. Why is this person so coachable? Why does everyone like this person? Why is this kid the best? Always be curious to why, because you'll see all these answers come from different people. And ultimately, you can learn so much from the environment around you that sometimes the information doesn't need to be in the internet. Sometimes it's like right in front of you. Ooh, I love it. In other words, people, success leaves clues. Right. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yep. Someone's doing something, defining success, copy. Right. I always say copy genius. Like it's yep. really not that, not that not that difficult. Brian, my man, I really appreciate you. And for all of you who are listening uh, to today's episode, again, I thank you. I hope uh, you found some value in it. I know you did. Uh, be sure uh, you can visit you recruit you dot com. You recruit you dot com. I'll have today's show notes there, and I'll also have um, how you can get in touch with Brian through uh, Play Easy, particularly if you know if you are one of those types of event organizers or coaches. I'll tag him um, in my show notes at yourecruityou.com. And then lastly, uh, just be a good teammate, right? Uh, just share it on social media, tag you, recruit you. Um, but until next time, this is your recruiting coach, Quito Delgado reminding you that college recruiting starts with you. What steps are you taking today to earn an athletic scholarship tomorrow?